Hello, I'm Professor Lisa Schultz at the University of St. Thomas, and I just want to welcome all of you on behalf of the um, Terence J. Murphy Institute for Catholic Thought Law and Public Policy, which is a joint venture of the Center for Catholic Studies and the School of Law at the University of St. Thomas. I want to welcome you all to this third in a, a three-part series that was uh, co-sponsored with, or worked on with the, the um, UST Law Journal on IP and social justice. Um, I had the privilege of serving as co-director of the Murphy Institute from 2009 until last June. My predecessor um, in that role as co-director was Professor Tom Berg, the James L. Oberstar Professor of Law and Public Policy. He is also the moderator for today's event. In 2009, he convened a private roundtable bringing together a small group of IP scholars from Christian and Jewish backgrounds to brainstorm about what those religious traditions might add to the IP thought. That was followed by a larger public conference at UST Law in 2013, adding the perspectives of the Muslim faith and resulting in a um, publication of the Law Journal, Symposium Volume on Intellectual Property and Religious Thought. The next step was taken in September 2015 with an international interdisciplinary interfaith conference that was co-sponsored um, by the Von Hügel Institute at Cambridge's St. Edmunds College and that took place at the University of Cambridge in England. After that conference, the Murphy Institute sponsored a Murphy Fellow from the Von Hügel Institute to work with Tom Berg and Roman Choley in putting together the book that was eventually published by Cambridge University Press. Patents on Life, Religious, Moral, and Social Justice Aspects of Biotechnology and Intellectual Property. This book came out a mere 10 years after that first private roundtable that was convened by Tom Berg. Today's program is going to give you just a taste of the vibrant exchanges at the Cambridge Conference and the pages of this important book. Let me turn the program now over to Tom, the creative inspiration for this groundbreaking, groundbreaking work. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, and thank you to you and the Murphy Institute, Michelle Rash, um, for um, support over time and support with this program. And thank you to Mary Susan Gerber, Editor-in-Chief of the Law Journal at St. Thomas, who's been instrumental in this program as well. And thank you to our, our speakers for coming today. Uh, so the uh, speakers today will, uh, our distinguished speakers, speakers today, will discuss uh, two issues concerning the legal, social, and moral questions raised by patents on biotechnology. Uh, and uh, in both speakers will be drawing on their chapters from the book that Lisa mentioned called Patents on Life, uh, published by Cambridge Press. The book gathers varying perspectives, including religious perspectives on the social and ethical questions raised by patents on life, whether that's human biological material, uh, animal uh, biological material, or plant life. Uh, this book aims to, and I'll show it here on the, on, the, on the screen briefly, there it is. You can get it on Amazon and other places. Uh, the book aims to be a resource across disciplines to help lawyers, policymakers, NGOs, ethicists, and religious leaders understand each other's perspectives. The questions covered in the book include those to be discussed today and, and also a number of other questions. Uh, can you patent and what should be the limits on patents of embryonic stem cell technology, gene editing technologies such as CRISPR? What is the fair distribution of benefits from the use of genetic resources in biodiverse nations? What are fair licensing practices for ag bio companies to follow with respect to farmers who use genetically modified crops? Uh, the book and the entire project here has been a transatlantic project. It has American and European authors that received substantial support, as Lisa mentioned, from the Murphy Institute and also from the Von Hugel Institute at St. Edmunds College, one of the colleges of Cambridge University. And that makes for interesting comparisons uh, across, the, uh, across the Atlantic. For example, you might be surprised to know that there are um, substantial limits 
on patenting embryonic stem cell technology in Europe, but not in the US, despite the, our pro-life movement's strong opposition here to the use of embryonic stem cells. Uh, our book is distinctive in adding religious reflection to issues that have been discussed in global, political, moral, legal settings for quite a while. Issues like uh, the uh, uh, availability of medicines for uh, 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 essential medicines for disease in developing countries that Professor Bagley will be discussing. That has been debated for a long time in uh, in, in global circles uh, and the effect of patents on those uh, issues. Uh, but religious reflections have not been brought in, we think, as much as they could be. Uh, the Catholic, Jewish, Muslim, and other great religious traditions have long, rich histories of reflection on the human condition and on what human beings owe each other. Religion is also an important source of public value, moral values worldwide, especially in many developing nations of the Middle East and Africa, where these issues are important. Finally, international religious groups have spoken on these issues, uh, including especially the Catholic Church. Both Pope Benedict and Pope Francis, for example, have criticized what they've called excessive zeal for patent rights concerning essential medicines in developing nations. Regional groups of bishops and Catholic relief organizations have also publicly urged that developing nations should receive rewards from their genetic resources and that patents on genetically modified crops should not be used to interfere seriously with farmers' practices. We hope this book will expand and enrich the debate over these important issues. The two presentations today give great examples, so let me now turn to the the speakers, uh, Professor Margot Bagley from Emory University and Professor Josh Sarnoff from DePaul University. I won't go into their long bios. Uh, they um, are uh, both leaders in publication of books, chapters, uh, testimony before uh, Congress and other bodies, work on com uh, committees, work on governmental committees, uh, both uh, uh, here in the United States and overseas. You can find links to their bios on the Murphy Institute website. Uh, and uh, Professor Bagley will be speaking about uh, 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 access to essential medicines in developing nations. Professor Sarnoff will be speaking uh, about uh, limits on the patentability of naturally occurring products uh, and things. Uh, there will be room for you to ask questions if you use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And we will then, uh, I as the moderator will, uh, will pose those questions in a sort of organized fashion to the speakers. And with that, I will uh, uh, stop and turn it over first to uh, Professor Margot Bagley. Thank you so much, Tom, for the invitation uh, to be here and, and actually for starting me on this particular path with, um, it was many years ago after I'd given a talk at the University of Minnesota School of Law um, and Tom encouraged me to take that talk and turn it into a paper and it dealt with um, applying religious thought to a particular IP issue. And, um, the round table that was mentioned, the, all of these projects that really are the brainchild of Tom Berg, I think have added so much richness to our discussion of these issues by getting us to think about the role that religious thought can play as applied to intellectual property. So my chapter in the Patents on Life book um, really does this again. It applies religious thought to a particular patent issue um, namely the theft rhetoric used by pharmaceutical companies and commentators to scare, shame, and bully developing countries in an effort to keep them from granting compulsory licenses on um, pharmaceuticals and biological drug products. 
And this issue also has relevance to the WTO TRIPS waiver proposal uh, regarding COVID-19 vaccines and, and therapeutic products that I believe we'll be dis discussing in the Q&A. So I'd like to begin with a story. There we go. So in Europe, a woman was near death from a rare form of cancer. There was one drug that her doctors thought might save her, a type of radium that a druggist in the same town had recently discovered. However, the druggist was charging $4,000 for the drug, 10 times the cost of manufacture. The sick woman's husband, Heinz, went to everyone he knew to borrow money, but could only get together about half, $2,000. He asked the druggist to sell it to him more cheaply or to give him more time to pay for it. But the druggist said, no, I discovered this drug and I'm going to make money from it. So having tried every legal means, Heinz gets desperate and considers breaking into the man's store to steal the drug for his wife. Should Heinz steal the drug? Lawrence Kohlberg used the way that study participants responded to this and other stories to assess their stage of moral development. The moral dilemma arises because allowing someone to die when you could save their life is morally wrong. But stealing is also morally wrong and for Heinz to take the drug without permission would be considered stealing. But is it possible for Heinz taking of the drug without permission to not be viewed as theft at all? Might the druggist instead be the thief if he tried to keep the drug from Heinz? If so, what theory would explain such a conclusion? These are some of the questions that I'd like to explore in the next um, few moments. And they are surprisingly relevant to an important aspect of the access to medicines discussion today, the right and ability of countries in the global South to grant compulsory licenses on biologics and other kinds of patented pharmaceutical drug products. So patents and drug products seem to go hand in hand. The right to exclude that is made available by a patent is considered essential or necessary to incentivize the exorbitant cost of drug development that's estimated as between 200 million and $3 billion. However, drug prices are soaring in rich and poor countries, yet efforts by countries to reduce costs through mechanisms such as compulsory license routinely meet with censure at the hubris of even considering harm to the goose that lays the golden eggs of new medical breakthroughs, with such efforts often being labeled as theft. Now, the use of theft framing is not new to IP. You may not have seen this particular YouTube takedown notice before, but you get the idea. And the use of theft rhetoric in patent law also is not new. And I have several examples on this slide here, including one from the 45th president. But in the area of patents, theft rhetoric can have a particularly pernicious effect. It tends to constrain policy choices and government actions that can mean life or death to millions of individuals, especially those living in the global south. The notion that stealing is wrong derives at least in part from the Judeo-Christian roots of the Ten Commandments and its injunction or their injunction against stealing. One of the cases that I enjoy teaching in IP survey is Upright Music versus Warner Brothers, where the defendant is accused, is accused of sampling a small portion from one of the plaintiff's recordings without permission. So when a judge begins his decision with the line, thou shalt not steal, it's a pretty good bet things are not going to turn out well for the defendant, which they did not in this case. But note that the judge quite explicitly classifies copyright infringement as a violation of the seventh commandment a moral wrong. And there are a surprising number of theft of property cases dealing with tangible and intangible property, which mention the seventh commandment or the eighth commandment, depending on which version of the Bible you're using. And while many of these cases are old, some are relatively new. And while the courts are not explicitly relying on the commandment as the basis for the decision, invoking the commandment is doing some work for the judge. It is making a link between the moral law and theft. 
Here's another interesting one where the judge is calling violation of an IP right theft and um, a breaking of the seventh commandment. So these are not isolated occurrences. References to the 10 commandments have appeared in at least 846 US cases since the early 1800s, not all IP cases. Um, and as Professor Eidsmo notes, these usages demonstrate how thoroughly ingrained into our culture the Ten Commandments have become to the point that the use of this terminology lends instant recognition and moral authority to the injunctions they describe. Now, I don't believe that these linkages are being made thoughtlessly or unconsciously, but what I find more worrying actually is the non-negligible number of commentators calling a certain kind of activity compulsory licensing of drug patents, theft. A compulsory license is basically the government allowing a third party to practice an invention covered by a patent without the patent owner's permission and requiring that the third party pay some specified royalty to the patent owner. A compulsory license doesn't require the patent owner to do anything, just sit back and receive the royalty, but it does prevent the patent owner from stopping the third party from practicing the invention. Compulsory licenses are explicitly allowed under, internet, under international law, the WTO TRIPS agreement, but the rhetoric of theft in relation to compulsory licensing seems intentionally designed to prevent countries from exercising these rights. And to counter what might otherwise appear to be a moral obligation to save life when it will not harm you to do so. Consider the following examples. Several years ago, I was troubled by a Wall Street Journal op-ed castigating the Thai government's issuance of compulsory licenses on two HIV AIDS drugs and a heart disease drug. And according to Ronald Cass, Thailand had engaged in theft. We called it Thailand's effective theft of pharmaceutical companies' IP, um, that there was this growing appreciation that trampling patents to allow a middle-income nation to cut its spending on drugs seriously threatens the world's system of protections for innovation. And what really disturbed me about this op-ed was the characterization of Thailand as somehow ripping off drug companies and harming innovation, when in fact, Thailand was in compliance with its international obligations and the Thai compulsory license was for, and the compulsory license was for the Thai public health system. And in addition, middle income uh, does not mean middle class. These countries are still quite poor. In fact, as Joe Johnston and Jamie Love noted, in 2006, Thailand had an average per capita income of 819 per day. For the bottom 80% of the income distribution, the average was 522 per day. The pre-compulsory licensing price for the heart disease drug products was $2 per day or nearly 40% of the average income of the bottom 80% of the population. More recently, other commentators have used this same theft language to describe a compulsory license, including the, Bayer, uh, the CEO of Bayer, characterizing a compulsory license granted by the Indian government as essentially theft. And this Compulsory license was granted on a cancer drug that Bayer had priced so high in India that it was only available to 2% of the patients that needed it. Here are a couple more examples. And in each case, we see the mention of stealing in regards to IP, and that is, this is a threat to innovation. Um, here, compulsory license, it's state-sanctioned theft, that will discourage companies from developing the next generation of medicine. So we see these commentators basically combining two messages. One, that compulsory licenses are morally wrong because it's theft. And two, compulsory licenses will harm innovation. And that gets at understandable self-interest. We want new drugs to be developed. And I'd like to take a closer look in the short time I have left at each of these ideas in turn. So first, if it's if compulsory licenses are morally wrong because it's morally wrong to steal, I and the moral wrongness of theft derives from the Judeo-Christian and moral law, then it may be instructive to take a closer look at the meaning of that law. And in the Bible, the Ten Commandments do not exist in isolation. 
they're part of a larger, richer context. And I think that Jesus really clarifies this when an expert in the law asked him, which is the greatest commandment? And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And I think that what Jesus was explaining is that the Ten Commandments are about love. Love for God, the first four. Love for your neighbor, the last six. We show love to God by not putting other gods before him or um, making idols or bowing down to idols or taking his name in vain and choosing to spend his Sabbath with him. In terms of love for our neighbor, well, dishonoring our parents is not loving. Um, murdering is not loving. Cheating on our spouses, not loving. Uh, lying on our neighbor, not loving. Coveting what our neighbor has, not loving. And stealing is not loving. And I think that perhaps because of that love orientation, there are in the Bible explicit instructions regarding a variety of actions that would otherwise be considered stealing. And these actions involved in the Jewish concept, Jewish concept of paya, I think provide a useful analogy that can inform the way that we view limits on pharmaceutical patents. We find these descriptions in Leviticus 19 and 23 and Deuteronomy 24. So when you reap to the, har the harvest of your land, do not reap to the edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner residing among you. When you're harvesting and you overlook a sheaf, don't go to bat to get it. Leave it for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow, so the Lord your God will bless you. When you reap, do not reap to the edges. Don't go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. And I think this is really interesting. I am the Lord your God. Do not steal. So these examples are so important that not only are the poor not stealing nor trespassing, the landowner is enjoined from harvesting to the edges or going back to get the forgotten sheep or um, picking up the missed grapes. What is left does not belong to them and it would not harm them to let the poor have it. It seems that God wanted people to trust him, not wealth to supply their needs. So I think it's important for me to note that we don't live in a theocracy, and I'm not arguing that the Ten Commandments, or even some of them, are the foundation of U.S. law, nor am I suggesting that we adopt Levitical approaches to dealing with current day legal problems. But what I am doing in this talk and what I did in the chapter was make an invitation to consider another perspective on the meaning of theft, drawn from a text widely considered as sacred. And making an argument that current uses of theft rhetoric in relation to patent law to the extent they aim to resonate with Judeo-Christian notions of morality are both incomplete and dangerous. Incomplete because they don't take account of the full definition of theft in that context. And dangerous because when governments in the global south are threatened with economic sanctions, if they issue compulsory licenses, they may not do so and people may die as a result. I think it's important also to remember that inventors do not have a natural right to a patent. Um, governments grant patents to meet utilitarian goals. So when the Supreme Court decided in eBay versus Merck Exchange that um, the remedy for violation of patent infringement of a patent right is not always an injunction, that wasn't theft. Um, and when the same court decided that isolated genomic DNA was not patent eligible, that was not theft, even though it invalidated thousands of patent claims. Now, in relation to the second message, and I'm, I'm running out of time, so let me wrap this up, um, that compulsory licenses will harm innovation. Two points. We already are not getting many of the drugs we need, and ones we get, we often cannot afford because of the skewed incentives of the pharmaceutical industry. I think this graphic by the European Patent Office is pretty um, telling because it shows that pharmaceutical R&D is disproportionately focused on chronic non-communicable diseases, even though many more disability-adjusted life years are lost for infectious diseases. So we as a global community are already not getting the best mix of drugs that we need. Um, also, the ability to obtain dramatic profits or what 
is driving pharmaceutical company decisions about the drugs to research and produce. Um, this is from last year showing that 76, um, a profit margin, gross profit margin of 76.5% for pharmaceutical companies, 37% for 357 S&P 500 companies. The pharmaceutical industry is consistently one of the most profitable on the globe. And this is not surprising. These are companies, their goal is to maximize shareholder value. We should not expect them to be charitable organizations. Um, this is another slide showing the same thing. Um, also, pharmaceutical companies are often focused on developing treatments for rare diseases for which um, cost, drug costs are very high. In fact, in 2012, these drugs represented 1% of prescriptions that were written in the US, but accounted for 25% of the dollars that were spent on all prescription drugs. So it makes sense for pharmaceutical companies, but it may not be a best for us um, as consumers in society more broadly. Um, and these decisions and the fact that these decisions are being made based on the ability to generate profits was really confirmed by that same Bayer CEO when talking about that compulsory license that India granted, he said, is this going to have a bit effect on our business model? No, because we did not develop this product for the Indian market. Let's be honest. We developed this product for Western patients who could afford this product quite honestly. So when decisions are made about where to invest R&D dollars, they're made based on wealthy markets. What they get in poorer countries is largely gravy. Doesn't mean that companies don't want gravy, they do, but it is possible um, for less profit to be made and companies still to do quite well. The compulsory licenses are not getting at lost sales. These are sales that would never be made because the poor people in these countries would not be able to afford the prices that the companies were charging for them. Um, more on that. And something, and again, this relates to the WTO CHIPS raise uh, waiver because a number of times in discussions, um, people mentioned what happened uh, during the late 90s, early 2000s in relation to HIV AIDS drug. And if you have not seen the movie Fire in the Blood, I encourage you uh, to find it. I think it's on Netflix, I'm not completely sure, but millions of people lost their lives because uh, pharmaceutical companies and Western governments blocked access to low cost drugs um, in the global South. And there's a concern that something like this can happen again in relation to COVID. Uh, so we need to, or returning to the story at the beginning of my talk, um, is it possible that Heinz has a right to the drug for his wife? or to put it in a patent context that a government has a duty to allow a third party to provide that drug or vaccine um, via compulsory license or some other mechanism to Heinz in a way that will not harm the druggist? Yeah, certainly. When we consider the broader meaning of theft illuminated by the biblical concept of Taya, we should be willing to conclude at a minimum that a developing country issuing a compulsory license is not theft. Okay? and should not be characterized as such. And recognize that in fact, the poor do have a right to free or low cost life-saving drugs, as long as providing such drugs does not unduly harm the drug provider. So if to some extent our notions of the moral wrongness of stealing derived from the 10 commandments, we shouldn't look at those commandments in isolation. Um, and I like this quote from Professor Robert News. He says, though the gleaning laws are not extensive, they provide us with significant insight into the command against theft. What the modern mind call, might call theft was not so defined in the Old Testament. Human need had a right of access to the basic essentials of life. For the poor to take food from another person's land was not theft, but it was wrong for the more affluent person to withhold it. So when we consider the biblical analogy of Paya, it allows us to begin to reframe the discussion and ask who is stealing from whom? Are our policies out of balance such that the poor are being robbed of what they are due? These are not easy issues to address. There are no risk-free solutions, no clear way to know exactly how to optimize access and innovation at the same time. But we may be better able to get to win-win outcomes if we open our eyes to other ways of viewing competing interests and allow our legal discussions 
to be informed by analogies from important traditions that have in the past informed our constructions of right and wrong and of morality itself. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. When we put these two phrasings of the commandment together as Christ did, we can view theft in relation to pharmaceutical patents in its proper light. We can seek and develop appropriate exceptions to patent rights that do not eviscerate protection or incentivize seeing, um, development, but provide the balance society needs. Perhaps then in the pharmaceutical context, at least, we will begin in the words of Martin Luther King Jr. and the biblical prophet Amos to see justice roll down like water and righteousness, righteousness like a mighty stream. stream. So thank you so much. Um, and I will stop there. Thanks, Margo. I'll turn it over very quickly to Josh. And it's a pleasure to follow my good friend Margo. Um, so if you take two things away from this talk, the first is unauthorized, unlicensed use is not necessarily theft. And there's a difference between theft rhetoric and duty rhetoric. Um, first, let me add my thanks to Tom and to the Murphy Institute. It's truly a pleasure to be here. If nothing else, this should show why history and religion and scientific history matter. Um, there's more in my book chapter as well as the book. I don't get a royalty, so please do buy the book. And with that, let me um, talk a little bit about what I cover in my chapter. Uh, hold on. There. Um, and try to give you a feel for what, um, try to give you a feel for kind of what the history tells us. And then I'll tell you a little bit about the current state of patent law and why it's so out of whack, as uh, Margo pointed out. But then talk about something that obviously is on everybody's mind, which is uh, pandemics and how the patent rights and trade secrecy and know how relate to it. So going to the history, um, our whole concept of property derives from John Locke. Most people don't realize that his property theory was based on religious history um, and religious theory that God having made humans morally equal, this is the love thy neighbor as thyself, second commandment that Margo was referring to. I'll come back to that at the end. Um, and private property rights were based on a command to be fruitful and multiply, to be consistent with utilitarian productivity, but it was also to support the rest of the world and excess was supposed to be traded. That was the only reason why anyone had a right to excess. Um, but there were also equality-based limits, in particular, uh, the as good and enough proviso and the spoliation proviso, which when applied to intellectual property, which is a non-depletable good, uh, may suggest that there's no, as Margot said, natural law right to property. Um, by the time we get to the Industrial Revolution, um, it was clear that people thought that discoveries came from God and that scientists, therefore, were not inventors in the sense of exercising their own creativity, but were God's way of revealing nature for human benefit. Therefore, um, the scientists could both only claim users' rights, not property over the ideas and scientific discoveries they had, but more importantly, as Lord Camden said, and I'll read to you from in a second what he said, um, scientists had a moral duty to share their knowledge freely, and fame and honor would be sufficient rewards so that what anything more than that would be hoarding of knowledge, which was contrary to the productivity principle. So uh, as Lord Camden said in the Parliamentary History of England, thus the divine creations of science and nature were revealed to humanity through the efforts of scientists, those favored mortals who share that ray of divinity we call genius and were intended to be freely available. Um, those uh, um, scientists were entrusted by providence with the delegated power of imparting to their fellow creatures that instruction which heaven meant for universal benefit. They must not be niggards to the world or hoard up for themselves the common stock. Given that understanding, there should have been no intellectual property, but 
as a matter of positive utilitarian views, um, we thought that maybe we would get more innovation if we created private rights to re, uh, receive some benefits and exclude others. That's where we get to by the late 19th century. But even by then, um, the understanding was that there was a big difference between science itself and inventive creativity. Um, this goes back to the current discussion of what can and can be patentable. Almost every country around the world has expressed limitations um, for man found things, which are usually referred to as products of nature or principles of nature or scientific principles. You can't get a patent on science itself. Um, there's a lot of debate over what types of advances uh, based on those discovered natural principles are patent eligible. Um, but the basic problem is that we just don't know enough about exactly where to draw that line. I'll come back to that in just a second. But I want to read to you from William Robinson, probably the greatest patent historian of the um, 19th century. So to benefit by the discoveries of his fellow men is thus not only a natural right, it's also the natural duty which every man owes to himself and to society. And the mutual universal progress thence resulting is the fulfillment of the earthly destiny of the human race. So scientists, again, had a duty, a public duty of transferring their knowledge for public benefit without claiming it as property. That duty has become diluted in the 20th century, um, and we'll see in a second some of the consequences of it, but at least by the 21st century, which we're now living in, um, people are starting to question it seriously. So um, where are we now? Natural discoveries as such are not patentable. Isolated DNA and diagnostics are the current area of hottest concern. Um, obviously, many of you should be knowledgeable about the Myriad gene patent case for uh, the breast cancer genes, where the Supreme Court re-acknowledged that science can't be patented and simply isolating DNA from its natural conditions makes it unpatentable. But there's also another case called Mayo versus Prometheus, where the Supreme Court said, when you discover a natural correlation, even using a synthetic uh, administered drug, that uh, you can't simply patent the diagnosis based on that discovery. Again, these are things that should be kept outside of the patent system because they need to be free for all to use as the basic building blocks of science and nature, which helps us to progress faster than trying to create property in it. Um, in another area, unfortunately, the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit has been constricting our doctrine of experimental use so that experimental uses in research now, if they're done with any commercial intent for the future, are considered to be infringing. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, in many other countries, the experimental use doctrine is much broader. Conversely, in other countries, isolated DNA may, in fact, be patent eligible. Um, Patents now extend to business methods. Again, usually in the US, you, it's easier to get a business method patent in most other areas and only uh, exclude business methods as such. And then we have very difficult time trying to figure out whether or not the claimed invention really has some form of technological advance or some other type of advance which should be considered excluded from the patent system. The most important thing, though, is, is that the quid pro quo of the patent was its disclosure of how to make and use the patentable invention. But now we routinely require less disclosure than what's called undue experimentation, which allows the patent holder to both get a patent and to keep what should have been um, trade secret or knowledge or know-how that they had to disclose for public benefit. This is critically important because if in fact, all of the patents on things like vaccines, which I'm about to talk about, had been able to describe how to make them, then the compulsory licensing that Margot was talking about would be highly relevant because any other country could simply take that disclosed knowledge in the patent 
and with a compulsory license authorized production of vaccines. But we also know that vaccine production is incredibly difficult and that companies are preserving their know-how and keeping it relatively close to their vast licensing, only a few companies, and that creates a shortage worldwide. So here's why it matters. Um, think about Pfizer. Pfizer has been sued for the unauthorized use of a patented research tool, M neon green fluorescent uh, chemical that helped it to identify uh, target virus particles during its clinical trials. Um, it is not an infringement um, because of a legal exclusion from patent infringement, which defines as not even constituting patent infringement, not even a defense. It's just not patent infringement to engage in the unauthorized use of a patented research tool for the development of information in order to get rapid FDA approval. And the reason we do that is precisely to promote innovation much faster and to get drugs to market much faster. If it were not for that unauthorized use from Pfizer, then we might not have their vaccines as quickly. So when people say patents have not been a problem, it's only one of two reasons why. The first reason is either because during the clinical phase, Pfizer and others use those patents in a way without authorization, the theft that people complain about, in a way that legally isn't theft, but is perfectly legal. Or in an even earlier stage, Pfizer and others actually did use patents, but without authorization. Maybe in some cases they had authorization, there has been some licensing of early stage uh, mRNA technology, including the vaccine um, delivery systems of lipids from various companies. Um, but the whole premise here is that patents, if they were able to disclose how to make and use it, you could compulsorily license them where it's needed for either R&D or for manufacturing. And where it isn't, in many cases, it's simply not infringement, or if it was infringement, actually enforcing the patent rights would have slowed down manufacturing and research and distribution. So patents only have not been a problem precisely because things like a trip waiver, non, um, the lack of legal prohibition has been in place. And we, it's not in place for manufacturing and distribution, and that's precisely why it needs to be done. Second, we know that the failure to scale up manufacturing is, um, requires know-how, which is being kept as a trade secret. Again, as I said, this is unjust enrichment because the premise of the patent system was when you disclose, the, and assuming that these patents have been, uh, sorry, these vaccines have been submitted for patent rights, the premise is you also should have to disclose how and they can use it. If they haven't and are retaining know-how that they knew at the time of filing, that should be a, a violation um, of the patent, even if under the US law, you can no longer invalidate a patent on that basis. But it just goes to show that the theft rhetoric runs both ways. Finally, and most importantly, vaccine nationalism. As we know, the US and other countries where these things are manufactured, have been keeping the vaccines to themselves. And if the consequence of that, if you look at the scientific projections, is that more worldwide deaths will result. It's not just that we're gonna save more people in the US, but we'll lose more people overseas. More overall deaths will result from keeping the vaccines to ourselves. If we were to truly um, treat our neighbor as we would want to be treated, which is not just the Christian um, second commandment or the Jewish second commandment as read into the sixth through 10th commandments. Um, it's also the basis of every moral code around the world, which is the golden rule. If we were really to take that seriously and we thought that all lives were valued equally, we would give those vaccines to the World Health Organization to distribute in terms of the highest priority. Why does this matter? Even if we were not acting morally, but only in our self-interest, it would reduce vaccine replication and therefore reduce the spread of viral variants. And by doing so, we would actually protect ourselves better in the future. So we need to start sharing immediately. Um, 
All of this goes to say we need to focus more on religion and deontological morality, not just on utilitarian ethics, although in this case as well, as I just demonstrated, they may go hand in hand. Um, second, we need to embrace the golden rule in practice. And to do that, we need to cultivate greater belief in the equal worth of all people. And that means returning to John Locke and the religious-based morality that was underlying property rights and its limitations. With that, I'd be delighted to answer any questions. All right, thank you, uh, Josh Sarnoff, and thanks uh, also, Marco Bagley. Uh, we have a couple of questions in the queue and I will start off with those and then maybe ask a question of my own uh, after that. But the, uh, the first question in the queue, and um, I think it would be to either one, maybe sp most specifically relevant to, to, to Margot. Uh, and it is, in your opinion, what are the general requirements to be able to grant compulsory licenses on pharmaceutical patents and which producers should be prioritized in that grant? Okay, well, thanks for the question. I mean, if, if we take a look at the international requirements under the TRIPS agreement, um, it doesn't have to be a national emergency or circumstance of extreme urgency. It can be public non-commercial use, such as in, in the Thai example and adequate remuneration going to the patent owner. So that goes to the idea of, of the owner not being harmed by the compulsory license. So I think that the general requirements, which are minimum requirements, I guess set out on the, in the TRIPS agreement in the US, we have some higher um, uh, requirements under 28 USC section 1498. But these minimal requirements, I think, are, are the ones that we would have for compulsory licenses. In terms of which producers should be prioritized, I'm really not sure how to answer um, that, that question. I think you would want to look at um, producers that have good manu a history of good manufacturing practices, certainly, and are going to be able to um, meet the requirements that the government has for getting the doses out of, of whatever the drug product is. And of course, with the with the TRIPS waiver, as Josh was um, talking about, it's it's not just vaccines. It's it's therapeutic products, all kinds of products related to COVID-19. And um, there have been incidences where patent rights have created problems. Medicine Sense, Sense Frontier, Doctors Without Borders has put out I think a very helpful document, um, COVID-19 IP myths versus realities. And they've got examples there of where patents actually have been problematic in relation to COVID um, therapeutics and personal protective equipment, et cetera. Uh, let me jump in and add two things. The first is, is that many people misunderstand how the TRIPS agreement works. The TRIPS agreement did not provide any standards and the Doha Declaration affirmatively recognized the unconstrained power of any government to issue a compulsory license for any reason whatsoever. It's that simple. There is no standard that has to be met. The TRIPS agreement does recognize compensation is normally going to be required, except in cases of antitrust violations. But the emergency authority only means you don't have to negotiate with the patent holder first. And, right, that's true. Yeah. And, and in cases of emergency, it is the country who gets to determine whether there's an emergency that warrants avoiding the negotiation. So the short answer is whenever there is a need right now for anything that you could produce by yourself, we should be issuing a compulsory license to assure better health outcomes. The second point is it's precisely that the compulsory license it can't be effectuated when the know-how needs to be transferred and is not disclosed in the patent that we have this problem. So for things like steroids, which are under patent, those may be relatively easy to produce. Remdesivir, although it's not clear how valuable it is as a treatment, um, is not that easy to produce and some know-how probably had to be transferred. So the compulsory license was necessary but not sufficient. 
The vaccines is really where the rubber hits the road though. And there we simply have to compel know-how transfer. Who has the power to compel that know-how transfer? Any company that has control over the businesses within it that have that know-how. The key is moral suasion to get them to exercise that power on behalf of the rest of the world. And as the ICC said, that's the International Chamber of Commerce, we're gonna lose a minimum of $9 trillion if we don't vaccinate the world rapidly. That's just a minimum, $9 trillion. We could easily compensate for any know-how transfers, even if any trade secrecy was permanently lost in that. We should pony up the money and save lives. Yeah, and just to add on, and thanks for um, clarifying that, um, Josh, but compulsory licenses are not necessarily the most efficient or effective way to go in this COVID scenario. I mean, in the normal run of things, yes, but that's why the waiver proposal is so important that would allow countries to not have to do a compulsory license on a case by case, drug by drug basis. That's, that's not what we need right now. We need broader, more um, efficient action. And uh, again, you can compensate people without a compulsory license for any value losses to the extent that it's needed. Um, that doesn't have to come from the co companies or countries that are issuing the compulsory licenses or using them. Yeah. Um, the key, I think, is, is that pharma is complaining because they're not being paid. This is why I go back to the point that it, Pfizer is a terrific example. Pfizer's statement is the following. The case brought by somebody suing them needs to be stopped before it becomes another burden on Pfizer and BioNTech as they continue to work on this vital vaccine. First, it's hyperbole because they've already produced it. And second, this is just about money to them. Similarly, companies are investing in billions to find a solution. And keep in mind, if you have a discovery, we're going to take your IP. I think that's dangerous. That's precisely what they did with Emneon Green, and now they're complaining that shouldn't happen. This is pure hypocrisy, and more importantly, it's just about money. The world can pay it and save lives, but they're choosing not to. Agreed. Yes, I mean, it's, it's, it's a particularly pointed example of the fact that intellectual property is a double-edged sword that every exclusivity that can encourage innovation uh, also has the potential to discourage further innovation, sometimes by the same, same people. And we see that particularly in the software industry, but, uh, but, but it, it's, it, there's a really pointed example here as well. It's worse than that, Tom, because it's, it's the hypocrisy of saying the patent system isn't a problem and yet they're claiming at the same time when they get sued that it is and shouldn't stand in the way of innovation and development and treatment. That's the problem is the hypocrisy here. If we got rid of the hypocrisy, we wouldn't be, we'd be able to work these things out. And it's not new in the same way that Abbott um, Labs was threatening not to introduce any new drugs into Thailand because of that compulsory license just a couple of years later when they were defending against a patent infringement suit, they were basically arguing that they should be granted a compulsory license <laughs> because they needed to be able to continue to produce this product for the public good. Um, so yeah, the hypocrisy in this area is rampant. All right, so we have a um, another uh, uh, question, Mia yeah, asked this, considering that the rates of coronavirus transmission is by far worse in the United States than elsewhere in the world. Does the US have a moral obligation to use the vaccine domestically to get the pandemic under control before exporting the vaccine outside the US? The transmission rates are not the same around the world. Shall I take this one? Sure. I'll, I'll talk after you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there are two responses. The first one is, we're talking about trying to vaccinate everyone in the US down to the least risky people before we will send any of our surplus overseas to the highest at risk people, including frontline workers around the world. That's just 
dangerous, not just bad morals. It's dangerous because it will end up having greater replication rates and more variant developments that will come back to kill more of us because of vaccine escape. The second thing is think about the logic here. The reason we have such bad transmission rates is precisely because of our awful values that people are refusing vaccines, but mostly they're refusing masking and social distancing. So somehow these libertarians think that it's fine to be able to take drugs away from everyone else in order to foster and prevent their bad behaviors. This is, again, the hypocrisy of the idea that somehow we should protect ourselves first, and yet we should not protect ourselves first by engaging in what everyone knows is even more effective, which is mask wearing and social distancing. Again, this is just bad behavior and bad morals through and through. Uh, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, and also when you see that the way that the variants are developing in other countries, even if you take a self-interested approach, then we should want, as Josh noted, to vaccinate those that are most at risk in other countries, and we should do what we can to reduce transmission rates here, and, and we're not doing that. Again, even if it was just a question of money, we would do it if we thought that the value was enough. The ICC says it's you know $9 trillion that we're going to lose to our economy. Think about the social unrest that that $9 trillion is going to cost. Think about the poverty and other problems that we're going to face as a result of paying you know, close to half of that. And yet we're still not willing to pay to purchase the know-how to allow other countries to gear up their own vaccine manufacturing even quicker without even deciding to send any of the vaccine we're producing overseas. This is just awful thought of the, contra the rhetoric of theft on steroids when really it should be about the rhetoric of duty to one's neighbor, which then actually helps us, helps us reopen trade, helps us reduce the overall cost of the pandemic over the you know, course of the next few years, and then helps to set up an international system where we're all gonna be safer when the next and even more deadly pandemic comes around. And it's even worse than that, Josh. I was just reading today or yesterday where, and it's not a peer reviewed study yet, but um, it looks like the Pfizer vaccine is not as um, effective against some of the variants. This was in a South Africa, Israel. I saw well, but this was in, in, Israel. Israel. Right. Exactly. in, in, in Israel. So if we're getting everyone vaccinated here, but we're letting the variants develop so that then we have to get you know, a new vaccine developed or some booster, that's just not logical. That doesn't make sense. Uh, we're at 1.30. Uh, I'm just struck by uh, this discussion, uh, by the truth of uh, Dr. King's statement that we are in an inescapable web of mutuality. And that is uh, certainly appropriate to the situation with, uh, with COVID and vaccines. Look, there's many other things we could say about patents, uh, about what they do that's good and what they uh, what their downsides are and how they um, can be misused. Um, the book has a lot of that. And of course, it's an ongoing question. But thank you so much to both of you. Um, you've been um, a great part of this project. Um, very honored to have you in the project. And thank you for coming and helping us uh, talk about these issues today. Uh, I don't know if Michelle Rash wants to uh, close us out here. I'll just say truly a pleasure both to participate in the project and today. Same here. Thanks so much for including me. Hey everyone, my name is Michelle Rash and I am the program manager with the Murphy Institute. Um, just want to pass along our own thanks to Margo, Josh and Tom for your time and dedicating this um, afternoon to a discussion on our recently released book. We'll have the recording of this program along with a link to the book on our website in the next week or so. And an announcement will be going out about that shortly here. Um, so we can wrap up this afternoon and thank you all again for being with us. <laughs>